I thought I was dying. I hyperventilated myself into passing out in an auto body parking lot. My husband called 911. I went to the ER in an ambulance from a panic attack. And when I came out of that experience, like 18 hours later, I was shattered, broken, like couldn't look at my phone, open my computer, function, depression. I just, it was like I was a teapot that got dropped on the ground. And 18 hours later, I'm holding all the pieces of myself in my hands, looking at it, going, I don't even know how to put any of this back together. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential and I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week I share real tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is an endurance athlete with a zest for adventure. That zest has taken her from struggling to finish a local fun run and learning how to swim as an adult to completing 18 Ironmans, including finishing second in her age group at the World Championships in Kona. But if that wasn't enough, she had a thriving coaching business that saw her ride a wave of success until the day that she found that the anxiety and then a panic attack inducing stress of running her business brought her to the edge of losing it all. But facing these challenges and learning lessons the hard way, she was able to rebuild and she went on to participate in what's arguably the world's toughest adventure race, Eco Challenge Fiji. Now, if you had a chance to watch the race on Amazon Prime, you know why I wanted to speak with her. Her openness, her dogged determination, and the fact that she's a self-proclaimed tough chick makes her totally one of a kind. I can't wait to share with you the conversation that I had with this mother, this athlete, and the host of a new podcast, Tales of Toughness, Sonia Wick. I want to talk to you today. So, so, you know, as you know, the podcast is We Do Hard Things. We Um, do hard things. uh, I love it. Talk to people who do hard things. And and quite honestly, um, you may not, obviously, you you know, you're you're, you're a mom. Um, uh, you've, You've done some tremendous things. But the way that they packaged your story on on Eco Challenge, um, on Amazon, I was so excited to see it because I watched, I watched Mark Burnett's last Eco Challenge in like yeah. 2003, mm-hmm. and it was so weird to see some of the same team members. But then, you know, t- later later in the in the race, you say you say you say we do hard things, and I was like, <laughs> that's like a direct quote. I, I have to talk to this woman. <laughs> I think there were, I think the I was trying to look for it actually back in the coverage I couldn't figure yes. out what episode it it aired on, but I think episode. I said something second like second last episode around 40 minutes into it you guys I was, are coming into camp okay thank and you you're, and you're literally like oh, yeah I was put here to do hard things yes yeah yes. I really believe that to be true so I, I would I I I want to learn from you and that's the reason why I do these podcasts and these conversations so you have done a lot of you know endurance races and ironmans and triathlons and all that stuff so i would already class you you know even before all of this stuff that you've been doing the last two or three years i would already say you seem pretty elite you seem pretty aggressive you seem like the type of person who likes to attack things and go after things has that always been in your nature um you know i always considered myself sporty and outdoorsy yeah. When I was young, but that wasn't always the way I was living my life. I, um, I definitely ha- had periods of my life where I was living one way, but sort of had this idea of who I was that was different from the way I was living. And the kind of more extreme sports that I've been doing the last, you know, now 14, 13 years really came after I had my daughter and, um, kind of having that realization about a year after having her, I had this mirror moment one day where I was looking in the mirror and I remember thinking, 
you're outdoorsy and sporty. But I was looking in the mirror and that girl was not looking back. I was like, where did she go? I had had a baby. It was tough. I was like nursing and she was sort of evil, my child. She's not now. She's beautiful. But at, the, at that point in time, she was giving me a run for it. And um, so I've definitely gone through phases of my life where I always thought I was something, but I haven't always taken action to sort of, I, you know, come to fruition how I idolized myself. Um, and so that started me on a trend. And really what I do more than run around as an endurance athlete is I look for opportunities that light me up. And if they light me up, then the motivation's there, everything sort of falls in line to go chase something really big. But if it doesn't light me up, then I can't seem to, you know, even get out the door. So yeah, I mean, triathlons lit me up for a long time. And I said, the goal I was trying to win my age group at Kona, Ironman, Hawaii, the world championships. And so that, that continued to light me up for a lot of years as I ran around trying to get that done. And then really when that happened, I didn't win. I got second, but it felt like I won because second's really close to first. <laughs> um, I had this period of like, wait a second, that didn't get me everything I thought it would get me. Um, and I kind of had a cri- like a bit of a crisis of identity when I was like, oh, I thought I would be a different girl. But the next morning I woke up and I literally looked at when you win Kona or get on the podium, you get this like wooden bowl. And I looked over on the nightstand and that wooden bowl was there. And it was a good big size bowl still in my closet. And I just remember thinking they give you, it's empty. Like the bowl that they give you that I've been chasing for five years of my life is empty. And that's about how I feel (laughs) from getting it. So that set me on kind of a different trajectory when it comes to doing hard things. And, um, what really lights me up? What am I really about? What do I, what do I want? So chasing that championship, right? The the best in your age group and the hardest thing. Yeah. In the world. What gave you the, I mean, where did that even start? Like what even gave you the confidence to say, this is something that I'm going to attack and do. So you're, you know, so you're a mother, you're looking at yourself and you're saying, this is not the person who I want to be. Did it literally start with just deciding I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to start being the person that I think that I should be in my head. Um, n- no, I think it started with adventure. I just realized I thought I was an adventurous chick and I wasn't doing any adventures. Okay. And I literally, after that mirror moment, I went down into our garage and my husband's mountain bike was down there. I didn't have a bike and I, he's like six foot four and I, I dug it out. He hadn't ridden it for years and I dropped the seat all the way down to the bottom because he's so tall And I used our REI dividend to buy like a kid hauling trailer, like that I could put my kid in. And I figured out how to hook that thing up to my husband's mountain bike. And we started going on adventures and that lit me up because it was getting me out of the house. My, my kid was, as I've said, a little bit wild and crazy, but when I put her in that trailer, she was chill. So (laughs) I was like maximum trailer time. We'd ride around and have these adventures. Um, And then, so that lit me up. And then I was like, wait, if I could lose some of the weight, maybe I could run again. I ran in high school. So I was like, oh, I could run again. So I I signed up for a 5K, even though I couldn't quite run again yet. And that made me for that week, it was like the next weekend, that made me for that week, like kind of train and and go on some jogs. And they had to be like walk jogs for 5K. And so then I did the 5K and I dragged the whole family there. They cheered. I was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. So you I signed up what for- your time was? Yeah, it was, um, I think I ran like a 29, like 29.30, something that's, like that. That's pretty good for someone who- I mean, I really run. hoofed it. I like had a little bit, I've got a little bit of talent in there, you know, like I do. Yeah. And I really hauled, like I, I was going for it. So yeah, everyone, like I felt so good afterwards and I thought, well, I'll just sign up for another 5k next weekend. And then that'll get me the motivation to train or do something active Monday through Saturday. And we, that first year from that point on that first year, I totaled it up a year later. I had done 50 races. Okay. (laughs) 
just, I needed that weekend. Like I needed the cheering and the event and the production to actually get myself, keep myself sort of accountable. And it was lighting me up. So I just kept thinking like, okay, this is working. It's a little bit crazy. And I'm spending like $35 every weekend on a 5k, but it's, it's motivating me in the right direction. So after that year, I started thinking, well, if I could learn how to swim, like I'm running and I'm biking, if I could learn how to swim, I could do triathlon, but I didn't know how to swim. I never learned. You you (laughs) never learned how to swim. No, I didn't. I could, I had like a pretty fierce doggy paddle, you know, like I, I could stay afloat and maybe not drown if the water wasn't too crazy, but I definitely did not know how to do any strokes or, or get in like too over my head. But I knew I could take swim lessons. I knew that was a thing. And I knew the gym would like watch my daughter for, for an hour while I did that. So I started how, doing so, that. So how old were you? So you, you had your daughter. She's 14, I think, yeah. right? She's 14 now. So I have this a 14 is like, year old as well. So, oh, daughter, yay. so I, the, I the best. get the age. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. how old would you I was you like 27. 27. So? And you, yeah. you just rock up to the gym and you're like, can I take uh, swim can, lessons? Can you teach a grown up? So, so you're there beside yeah. four year olds with water wings and stuff. Um, kind of. <laughs> like I wasn't in the same session. People think that often, yeah. but you actually can get somebody to teach you like more on the private. Okay. <laughs> Which was because there aren't other adults learning. So, you know, I have learned 52% of adults don't feel like they could save themselves in the water. Oh, like really? almost fifty-two percent of adults don't really know how to swim huh. competently. Well, I, I've learned that statistic recently, and I've been like, "Oh man, that's insane!" I, but I was yeah. in that boat. Um, I couldn't have like gotten into difficult water and saved myself. So it was good. I was doing it for my daughter. I was doing it for myself. I was doing it so I could do a triathlon. It was like win, 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 win. But the, the, and the reason I'm just I'm just focusing on these points is because what I struggle with the most, and I think, I mean, I know a lot of people struggle with is we look at people 10, 15 years into it. We look at what you did, you know, last year and go, yes. holy smokes, but, but nobody starts there, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. You didn't know how to swim. You're I didn't boring, know how to swim. You're boring uh, your, yeah. your, your husband's bike and, yep. and you're, you're like, can I run a 5k? Yes, uh, that's right. And that's, I'm literally just doing all of that based on that thing inside of you that feels like it was a bit of a light bulb or feels excited or enthusiastic about a thing. Mm. And I, I don't know how I had the, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I could take like the next step I could do is find the mountain bike or the next step I could do is go get a swim lesson. I never had any idea that it would, I would end up being featured on a TV show on Amazon prime for my swimming ability, right. In cold water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wouldn't have known that, you know, 14 years ago. Um, but I was inspired at that point in time to do a triathlon. And so I ran with what I needed to do to take that next step. I, I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. And so, so you progress into getting into yeah. your first triathlon. Yeah. Um, loved it. What was of that course. experience like? It was life affirming and okay. super exciting. I mean, I made it through the swim. I have this great picture of a, a woman, me getting out of the swim and the woman in front of me is like literally nine months pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So- it was like, phew, I survived. I lived. I <sighs> swam in that water. It was amazing. Um, and then I got on, on the bike, on my husband's bike, and I just rode my little heart out. And then I got to the run and I felt in my element. And I just ran my little patootie off and I got done. And, you know, it was a small sprint triathlon in our area. And I was third in my age group. So I like got a certificate for that. Yeah. And so I got that bit of like the ego boost and I looked at my husband and I was like, I think I could be good at this. Like, I, I think that was really fun. And I, I think that this could be a thing for me. And he just saw me lit up. So from that point on, he was, he was game on because he saw his wife happy and enthusiastic and excited. And um, Troy's been master supporter through this whole time, you know, just always always pushing me to take the next leap, go for it. What do you need? What funding do you need? What support do you need? So I've always had that um, like very golden nugget in my pocket of that Mm -hmm. spousal 
extreme level of spousal support. So, so you yep. get started in triathlons, you get yep. really heavy into it. Yeah. So 2009, 2007 was my first triathlon. 2009 was my first Ironman. I missed qualifying for Kona by one place, lit the fire under me, went back in 2010, qualified for Kona, went to Kona, had a great debut, debuted 15th in my age group. A month later, went to Ironman Arizona, won my age group at Ironman Arizona, requalified for Kona the next year, and pretty much was game on from that point forward. I, I heard you interviewed speaking about the fear that you had going into Eco Challenge. Yeah. And what I'm curious about is as you think back to learning how to swim, um, doing your first 5K, doing you know, the progression, right? The progression to the first tri- uh, you know, triathlon in, and then doing Ironmans and then, and then doing this. Would you say that the fear has always been there and was the same or as things got harder, did it become scarier for you? Mm. I think as it gets, as you get used to certain levels of fear, you're willing to go bigger and it becomes scarier, mostly in retrospect, because you look at what you were afraid of in the past and you laugh at being afraid of that because the things you're afraid of now are so much bigger and so much scarier. But I think the, the fear is similar. Like in the moment, the fear is very similar to the first time I got in the pool trying to swim to the other side. Um, in fact, I think maybe my, my association with fear and my relationship with fear is actually more of a dance now than it was in the beginning. Maybe even getting in the pool to learn how to swim was more scary than actually getting to Eco Challenge and, and being afraid of those things. Because I think I just have a lot more tools now and I understand myself a lot better and I know how I can depend on myself. Um, so I think my fears back in the day, I, I would fear things that were not in my control a lot more than I fear things that are not in my control today. Whereas back then I didn't have a lot of fear of what was in my control. And now I have more fear today of what's actually in my control. That's so interesting. Why is that? Just, just like a a stronger confidence in yourself or a, a maturity that you've developed or, you know, each time you've been able to prove something to yourself, you kind of hold on to that and pack it away for later or. Right. I think in the beginning, you're really, if you're so afraid of all the things you can't control, you don't have a lot of time to think about the things you can. And, and so if you, if you worry your mind with the weather and drowning and <laughs> all sorts of things that aren't, aren't, aren't really in your, in your control, you don't really have a lot of time to prepare for what you can control. And I think as you gain experience in that, you get to a race like Eco Challenge and you're pretty resigned to the weather. You're pretty resigned to what the course is going to hand, hand to you. You're not really spending a lot of time like stressing about those things, but you are definitely stressing about the things you can control. Like, is our food proper? Am I going to get us lost? Are my skills tight enough? Are, you know, all those things that you could control, you start to think more about, did I prepare properly, even though that's now out of your control, you can't prepare anymore, but you, you sort of, will I perform well? Will I be a good team member? What will happen when I'm really tired? Will I, will I be ready to face those demons? Hmm. And the things that are out of your control, you're like, yeah, yeah, I know I can't control those. So (laughs) I don't worry about those anymore. (laughs) And and so um, when, when you think about like what I think about doing so, so, so a, l- a quick story for me, for, for yeah, you, um, give it I've to me. never been athletic. Uh, mm, interesting. And so two years ago, I, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. Uh, Whoa. And was, was not, so was not eating well, was not athletic, um, had terrible sleep issues and indigestion issues. And I was very, very resigned to like, this is just, you know, when you outgrow your shirt, 
You know, when yeah. you, when you outgrow a large, you go to an extra large, when you outgrow right. an extra large in Canada, where I am, you go down to the States and you buy yeah. a large because your sizing is, is bigger. <laughs> we've got, we got plenty of sizes for you guys. <laughs> I can, I can go down to a large in America and I'd be like, look, I'm still a large, uh, <laughs> even though it's, it's, it's getting pretty big. And so my, my answer was just to buy bigger clothing. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, I took my kids, my wife and I took our kids to Disney and we were looking at photos of ourselves and it was just like, this is it, this is life. And we kind of became resigned. And then perhaps similar to you, but, but maybe not. Um, I got really depressed. I never mm. had depression. I've never had, I've never had any of that stuff. I'm, I, I have been mm-hmm. cynical. I have been pessimistic. I, you yeah. Know, all of that stuff. Yeah. But depression but is there different. It was like a two week period two years ago in September. Now um, around right, right now, two years ago, um, there was a period where it was just um, I got really depressed and hopeless. And it was because I think I realized that it was like, this is my life. This is That's what right. I'm doing. This is where I'm going. Not really very happy with it. Yep. Uh, don't, I don't, I, I, I have like, I, I have, I have money. I own a business. Um, yeah. I have four beautiful, healthy kids. I've got a great home. I've got friends. I go to church and yet I'm depressed. Something's not there. I can't explain to people why. And it took me a long time to grow out of that. And so um, I share all that to kind of say, you know, you, you're, you're rocking, you know, you, you know, oh, nine, 10, 11, yeah. year after year, uh, after year, year Kona, and you're, Kona, chasing, Kona. you're chasing, you're chasing, you're chasing. Yeah. And then, you know, you wake up one day and you look at your empty bowl and you go, what's next? What the heck? Or wait a what, second. What, what happened? Because wait a second that's kind of what it was like wait a second and you know that wasn't even my bottom that was just my like wait a second moment um it that put me on the what is it really about rather than like it was the first moment i realized that running around and beating people all day all weekend year after year after year, running around and beating other people was not actually what I was put here to do. <laughs> it, but it, sounds, feels, it feels good to be better than others. It feels so good. Um, and, and lots of people will say, no, no, it's about a lot more. It's a, but you know what? Like I was chasing podiums. I was, I was like, how many races can I win? How can I win Kona? The more races I win every year, the better that convinces me that I will be able to win Kona when October, this one day in October rolls around every year that started to be sort of the cycle of my life, waiting for this one day, spending the other 364 days trying to convince myself that I would be able to perform on this one day a year. And then I would go and it would be good or it would be bad or I wouldn't quite get there, right? And I ran that cycle for five years. So to some extent, I really was running around chasing podiums and people do this all the time. You know, they do it in business all the time. They do it as singer songwriters all the time. You know, there's a lot of parallels um, in a lot of different industries of how we, we set this goal, we chase it. We set another, we chase it. We just keep kind of on that hamster wheel of performance or achievement. And um, the best thing that ever happened to me was that I got to the top of the pyramid <laughs> and I woke up the next day, the day after but, getting but, everything you want. But I'm, I'm going to be a, a jerk here. You didn't yeah. win and no. you came in second. And, and I yeah. know when I read all your stuff, it sounded like it bothered you to come in second. No. Those, those six inches difference, you know, on the no. podium you talk about? No, it didn't. I was, no, it didn't. Okay. I had spent five years, when I set the goal, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, okay. and then I hung on to that thing with my lifeblood for so many years, I didn't even know what an ask that was. And it was through the five years that I understood what a hard ask that was. And so when I got second, I had an amazing day. The girl who was first is by and far genetically better than me. She's like <laughs> Olympic trials qualifier. You know, I'm like, I'm like a mom who, who just is willing to outwork everybody. Um, so no, I literally felt like I won. I was like okay. four inches down on the podium and a slightly smaller bowl. I basically won that race. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. So I, could, I couldn't quite tell. So you feel like you've run the race and now you're, yeah. you're asking yourself what's next, but you, you say that's not even the bottom. So then- that's, that wasn't the bottom for me. Yeah. So my what's next was, oh, I think because this isn't like chasing podiums isn't the thing. Really what the thing is that you serve others. Mm-hmm. Like that was my next, like, oh, you serve, mm-hmm. you serve. And so that was where I launched into building a coaching company for other Ironman athletes to help other Ironman athletes chase podiums. Like, no, chasing podiums isn't the answer. Let's set up a company to help other people chase podiums. (laughs) Okay, so you're laughing now. So, but at the time it felt right or what? It felt totally right. I thought, yeah, it's service. It's let's teach what I've learned. You know, I have, I had always coached athletes, but I'd had like a stable of maybe 15 athletes and no one ever left. So I, my knowledge never got to broaden beyond my 15 athletes or so. Um, so I thought, well, there, I have so much to share. I have so much to teach. Let's expand this. So I built um, a coaching company at the time to 150 athletes and seven assistant coaches um, and kind of tried to, you know, it was my first foray into entrepreneurship. And really soon getting into it, I knew it wasn't for me but I'm tough and (laughs) driven. And I thought, and entrepreneurs seem to complain all the time. So I just figured that was like par for the course is that we all complain about our businesses and it never really feels easy. And so you just keep pushing and pushing for this maybe future moment that somehow feels great. Um, But I had learned from triathlon that the journey is always what the destination looks like. Like you never get a great outcome with a crummy journey. The journey and the outcome are always linked so I was kind of like, wait a second, if this, if this is so hard all the time, am I ever going to really get to a place that feels great if the journey is this rough? Um, and really what it was around me and where I hadn't grown was in leadership and other people's expectations. So I suddenly have seven assistant coaches, a ton of athletes. Um, they're very passionate type A personalities who really want to get the most out of themselves. So there's a lot of conversations and a lot of feedback. And um, it's about two and a half years into that. We're successful. We're, we're, we're profitable. You know, things are going. But I had to make some, some changes in the business, both for the coaches and the athletes. And it got everybody like, like chickens. It got everybody like talkie, 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 talkie. And I had a... Um, I had a coach that kind of left and it was a little controversial and I was, I had a day where I was managing that and I had been having panic attacks um, when things got overwhelming in the business, which I had never experienced as an athlete. So I'd been having these panic attacks and I didn't really know what to do about them. I just would have to like breathe until they went away. I have them too. They suck. Yeah, they're, they're really hard. Um, and there, there's varying like degrees of them, you know? So I had been able to kind of like take a pause, get things under control, but I had this really bad day in the business and I was doing some triage. I'm calling athletes and in between these calls, I'm having panic attacks. So it's like call panic attack, call panic attack. And we drove to my husband, uh, the truck was in the shop. So we, we drive to the auto body parking lot and he is listening to me on a call and we get there and he looks at me and he says, Sonia, you've got to show up more professional, <laughs> which anyone who knows me knows that's not really in me. <laughs> 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 I'm not the most professional of people, but he says, you've got to show up more professional. And for some reason, that feedback, that extra n- nugget of feedback sent me into a really bad panic attack. And I, um, like the worst I've ever had, I thought I was dying. I hyperventilated myself into passing out in an auto body parking lot. My husband called 911. I went to the ER in the ambulance from a panic attack because they feel like heart attacks. You think mm-hmm. you're dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I came out of that experience, like 18 hours later, I was shattered, broken, like couldn't look at my phone open my computer, function, depression. I just, it was like I was a teapot that got dropped on the ground. And 18 hours later, I'm holding all the pieces of myself in my hands, looking at it going, I don't even know how to put any of this back together. It's like, I don't, it's so hard to explain what happens when you emotionally just break into a million pieces because you look back at the situation that caused it and you're like, well, 
well, what was it, Sonia? I was like, I, I just, I don't really understand. I just was not myself intact anymore. I was yeah. shattered. Yeah. And that was the start of my bottom. <laughs> so, the, so I had, um, what are we in September? Yeah. A month and a half ago on a Saturday, I had a really bad panic attack. Mm-hmm. I knew it was happening. And, um, and I couldn't explain it other than to say, it felt like I'm standing on the, I, I'm standing on the edge of a yeah. cliff mm-hmm. and, um, and I, I just, I'm, it's not that I'm falling. It's just that I have, I, I can't grab onto anything. Every time yeah. I try to grab something, it like, it turns to dust and kind of disappears in front of me. Yeah. And I just, you just can't grab onto anything. You can't. Yes. And so yep. it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a fun place to be in. Right. No, it's really not. Um, but, but how is it's it not. that that the woman, the person, the woman, yeah, who accomplished everything that you've accomplished, yeah, and and like I I've I've never done a triathlon, um, it scares the out of me the thought of it because um, like they're not easy. So even no. in though Mm-mm. each time that you ran it, you faced pain, you faced yep. challenge, you faced yep. setbacks, you pushed through. Strength, 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 strength. How does that stuff not carry like to, in Can't my mind it seems like it should carry over like like right. you, you, like like you've done all of this stuff yeah how is and it that now you know your husband just just giving me a little quick piece of feedback yeah like spiraling. shatters me to a million pieces yeah right there's this concept of um you know physical toughness and emotional fragility that's kind of this balance that i am coming to understand more about myself i literally was made like physically was made for war. I mean, you can beat the heck out of me. And the first thing that's always going to break on me if I'm, you know, training eight weeks really hard in a row is, um, is my emotional state. That's always been my emotional state. So I've always had this really deep physical toughness paired with this very tender emotional fragility. It's just part of who I am. And so for a long time, it's, that has, I have seen that as a negative and it getting to the bottom and then working my way out of that has been my transformation of seeing that as a benefit and sort of linking it to enoughness, that concept of, are we enough? What's enough? Are we too much? Sometimes I feel like I'm too much, Um, too much. Are we enough? And how does that relate to toughness? And really authentic toughness comes from enoughness. <laughs> mm. Yeah. That's when you get to that, that really authentic, spiritual, emotional, physical toughness all in alignment. That comes from your sense of, am I enough? Am I not too much? Am I just right? Right in my own skin. So as, as someone who's coached athletes, I guess I'm curious, you recognizing yourself, as you mentioned, you know, you're built for war, you'll take on the physical toughness. Um, I'm soft as hell. <laughs> like, like the reason why I had to lose the weight I had to lose and, and find stuff is because I'm like, you know, 37 now. So I was like 35, 36, 37 going like, oh, um, apparently, like, like I, I have a coach um, at my gym who the other day I said to them, Oh, during COVID, I did lots of running. I, I, mm-hmm. I didn't do any weightlifting. I didn't do anything, anything else. I just ran. And yeah. now that I've gone back to the gym, I'm like, my cardio is amazing. I'm yeah. he's like, yeah, running <laughs> builds cardio. <laughs> like, I'm like, but I didn't, I didn't even think of that. Like, like, I'm so basic that it's just like, hey, did you know that if you just like run 10K, um, yeah. you know, every day or every other day, you'll build up great cardio? And yeah. this is like basic stuff for people. So, so well. You- you're- work always works. Okay. What is that? Work always works. Like if you work at something, it's, it's piggy banks. We have all these piggy banks in our life and we're adding money to them. And if you put piggy banks in your running piggy bank, like you will literally be richer in your running piggy. Work always works. That, that's the way I got to the top of the sport is I just was willing to put in the work. But here's the key. If work feels like work, you won't do enough work for it to work. <laughs> mm. 
So we're talking about that fire and that, that, that that's hustle, right. right. Yeah. And it's not, if you can find a way to go in the direction that lights you up, you will put so much money in that piggy bank. And so that's where like, if running isn't your jam, then are you willing to put money in the rock climbing piggy bank? Do you love going to the gym, like the rock gym and just climbing walls and making friends and having a blast because you're, rock climbing piggy bank is going to get stout whereas you're running. So really it's like during COVID running for you probably felt like um, during COVID we've all felt isolated and out of control and running is a great antidote to that, right? Because we get out of the house, we get away. We don't feel isolated when we're running. We feel expansive. We feel adventurous um, and we feel a bit in control. We can go fast. We can go slow. We can go left. We can go right. So I feel like running has been one of those tethers for a lot of people during these times because it's such a great anecdote. So people are, they're being drawn to it naturally as a fix for what's going on right now. And then silently without their knowledge, exactly what you did, they're just putting money in their bank, putting money in their running piggy bank. And then they're waking up one day going, wait a second, I'm like legit fit, yo. <laughs> And that's like, that's the secret sauce. That's how I got to do the, the world's toughest race was putting money into piggy banks from a place of being lit up, being excited, being enthusiastic about that direction. Um, and then putting the money in because I'm having fun putting the money in. Find what you enjoy. If it's painting, do that. If it's writing songs, do that. If it's TikTok, do that. Um, Because that's what life is about, is finding what lights us up. And for me, adventure lights me up and and doing it with other people. Like friend calls, they want to go do a 10K paddle, and then they want to ride over to this peak, and then they want to climb it, and then they want to go have donuts. I'm the first girl they're going to call because I'm the first girl that's going to say yes. Like that's going to light me up. Whereas, you know, ask me to come to a CrossFit class with you and I'm not going to show like there's nothing (laughs) about that that lights me up, but for somebody else it does. And so you have to go in that direction. If you do that, you will find everyone has something that lights them up athletically to keep their body healthy everyone has that. So it's really a matter of like, keep exploring, keep looking. If you don't like running, don't run. If you don't like rock climbing, don't rock climb. If you don't like CrossFit, don't CrossFit. But if you do like something, if you do like swimming, if you do like water aerobics or stand up paddle boarding, or like do that and find other people to do it so that you can do it together and you can laugh and have fun and maybe have a beer afterwards. Then you're suddenly going to wake up with a very full piggy bank and muscles that you never knew you had. And you're not going to feel so soft anymore. But you're going to be like, wait, how did I get so hard? What was, what was the, the, was there even a moment where you had to hesitate, but what was the thought process behind saying yes to Eco Challenge? Mm, yeah. Um, the, when I saw the application video, um, I was on, so I have this fun trick with Facebook. I don't right now since the, since the show has launched, but pre, I'll only go on Facebook for 30 seconds okay. because Facebook will know. Like it's very good at relationships. And so it will know that you're only on for 30 seconds once a week. And it will give you like three super juicy (laughs) eye-catching posts because it knows like you're trying to break up with it. So one of those times I was on for my 30 seconds and it like flashed Eco Challenge application to me. Eco Challenge is back. Here's the link. And I I clicked on it and it had a little video and the video showed all that old coverage mm-hmm. that I'd watched when I was like 20 when the mm-hmm. show aired back in the late 90s. Yeah. And so I'm getting all the nostalgia and, and like really having warm, fuzzy feelings and like, oh, I so I like wanted to be those girls when I was 20 years old watching the show. And then at the very end of the application and video, it said, This is the race that eats Iron Man for breakfast. And I like flipped out. I literally flipped out because it felt like Mark Burnett was calling me out personally. I took it really personally, like, oh my gosh, I am meant to, tr- to try to do this. I don't know if they'll accept me, I don't, but if you say that, that he eats Iron Man for breakfast, you're calling me out. Like that's my background is Iron Man pretty completely. So that was, it was a light bulb moment for me, the minute he said that, I thought I got to find a group of Ironman athletes. I've never done an adventure race. So it's not like I have some team that I can, I've got to put together a team 
hopefully of people I think might be able to finish this crazy race, which I only know from the 1990s, how hard it was. Um, and we just have to try. So it was a, I knew it was hard. Uh, we went through a lot of trials once we got into the race of just trying to figure out how to be adventure racers. But I always knew in my gut that because this was a light bulb moment, this was meant for me because we got in the race. That was another confirmation. This is meant for me, this experience. Like I kept getting these light bulbs of like when I would have crisis of confidence or crisis of leadership, I would still get these light bulb moments that were saying, no, no, this experience is meant for you. It's meant for you. Um, so I knew I just ha had to keep pushing forward and it, it's been true. Like the platform that it's given me since it aired to talk about mental health, to talk about toughness. I mean, I never could have dreamed in like in my wildest imagination that it would have led to this, but I always knew it was going somewhere because I was following the light. And so when you're doing this race, uh, I mean, uh, like I used to do rally racing. Um, oh, so like sweet. I was a navigator in a car. And so oh you're just gosh. getting shook, to, shook around and we used to do Thank overnight you. rally races. Thank and you so we would start at 8 PM. We would race until 10 AM the next day, no sleep. Yep. Um, you're just getting, you're just getting thrown around. You're trying to yeah. calculate times and distances. And I could, I think I did five or six of them because I found myself at three or four in the morning, mm -hmm. just hating every second Thing. of it. Just, yes. just, yep. the, you know, the, the race seats are hard plastic, the straps, yep. then, then, you know, you slide off into a ditch and you're, it's, it's winter time. Cause we're up here, we're doing winter rallies. So yeah. now you got to try and pull a car out. And it's right. just like, I realized after four or five, I was like, I hate this. I, yeah. I, I don't like this at all. Yeah. So I can, I can imagine that there are huge moments over yes. the course of your, you know, six or 700 kilometer journey, whatever it was, you're just like, you know, whether it's the cold water or not, where you're like, I hate this. Why the hell am I doing this to myself? You know, yeah. like how, how do you not just give up? Like other teams did, you know, they, they hit yeah. the wall. They, they, and, and yeah. uh, you know, but how do you just not just go like, what are we doing here? Yeah. I mean, I think we all had our moments, but we recognized Luckily, we didn't all have them at once. I think that's when you, <laughs> that's when you give up. Um, or enough of you on the team have a compelling, have that moment, and it's compelling enough to convince the other people that you're not going to continue on, and therefore they can't continue on. And there's a there's a lot of dynamics that go there. I will say we never got there. Um, I where my crisis came was always personal. It was never. I hate this so much. I don't want to do it anymore. It was, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do this. It always was more internal. Um, when I hit hard, like heat, heat is a thing for me. And when I get really hot and kind of get into that pre heat stroke place, my mind goes really negative and it goes negative. Not in a, like, I want to quit. It goes negative in, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. And it will start this loop. I like, I equate it to like eating Cheetos on the couch. You know how like you open the bag of Cheetos and you just, you eat one, but then you eat another and another and another. That's what it kind of feels like. But in my brain, like I'm literally eating mind Cheetos of like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Um, and I had a moment like that really towards the end of the race, like maybe day eight or so. And, and I, I could, I couldn't stop it, like the the Cheeto thoughts. Yep. And then they led to a panic attack because it is really hot and my body isn't doing great. And then I'm feeding it this, I don't think I can do it. You know, loop, had a panic attack, stopped, got control of it. One of my teammates came back. He's like, what do we do? You know, once I got control, what do we, he'd never seen this. And I just said, we just, I just have to, I, we just have to wait and I have to get control of it. And then we got to go on. And so we went on and we were on our, our mountain bike. So steep, super steep hills. We're walking yeah. up half of them. And 15 minutes past later, the mud. you're past the mud. Yeah. Way past the mud. You, you didn't get caught in that having to drag the bikes. We did. The mud, did oh, yeah, okay. we did. Yeah. 
everyone did that. Everyone who made it through that did that. Yes. Okay. Um, it seems like the earlier teams didn't. didn't yeah. Like, if you quit before the mud, then you didn't make it. Okay. <laughs> everyone did the mud because it rained the whole first six days of the race. So it was muddy for everybody. But no, this was late, one of the later mountain bikes, which we thought we would slay. And here we are, you know, an hour into the mountain bike and Sony's having a panic attack on the side of the road. Uh, a second panic attack happened. And at that point, you know, two of the boys came back and they, they actually, they prayed for me, took my helmet off and uh, they put their hands on my head and they prayed for me and it gave me a couple of minutes and they reminded me of all these things like that my family loves me and, you know, things I, that were really positive and affirming to hear and I got a, a little bit of a break. And when I got up from that, I wasn't having a panic attack anymore one of my teammates said, I can push your bike for you. I can carry your pack for you, but I cannot change your thoughts. You have to change your thoughts. And it was one of the first times that someone had actually called me out for eating mind Cheetos. Like people don't call other people out for eating mind Cheetos, but your mind Cheetos are what makes your life, what the output of your life looks like is that dialogue that you have going on in your head. And so I thought, oh my gosh, he just called me out. I have to change my thoughts. And the only thought I could come up with that I could believe was your core body temp is fine. Like not good, not great, but I could believe that my core body temperature was fine. Okay. And so I start riding again and just in my head on continuous loop, instead of saying, I don't think I can do this. I said, your core body temp is fine. Your core body temp is fine. And boy, 20 minutes later, had the conditions changed? No. Had anything externally changed? No. Was I now up at the front riding with our top rider? Yes. So that was like a really illuminating thing for me that you can manipulate your thoughts if you can get yourself onto a different track. That is also true. Um, your performance and your output and sort of your, your life, the manifestation of what's going on around you, there's a lot bigger connection to the thoughts that you're feeding yourself than you think because the conditions didn't change. But if you look at Sonia, who's saying, I don't think I can do this. And Sonia, who's saying my core body temp is fine. Just those two different Sonia's one is having a panic attack on the side of the road. And the other one is riding with our top rider. So that's the only thing that changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's really when it comes to quitting the race, I was lucky that I had a teammate on my team who was willing to, to go there and call me out on the thoughts and, and was willing to keep our team moving forward because he was that intuitive on, on what was going on with people inside. Were, did we work as the best teammates? No, not necessarily. Do we carry each other's packs? No. Did, did I get us lost? Yes. But we, we did have that awareness um, to be able to keep everybody's mind in a place of forward motion and, and moving forward and moving towards more positive mindsets and positive thoughts when they weren't coming for everybody. I have been in situations where I've had the most remarkable life-changing um, moments um, and, and moments of clarity and moments of courage, and they never last. And so I'm, I'm, I'm watching you, you know, talk about what you've learned and, and what you found and in, in not super great detail, but I'm, I'm going, I wonder if six months later, the lessons mm -hmm. are still learned. How yeah. do you, so the hardest things that you learned about yourself or about life or about people or about what matters when you're swimming in the cold rivers or you're doing those things, how do you make sure that you don't, you don't lose forget that. It. You don't lose that. You don't forget it six months, nine months, a year later. Because that is a thing. Um, I like to say, like, sometimes I need to remember what I know to already be true. <laughs> I think where I don't, I don't want to lose these lessons. And I've been there. I've, I've gone through the cycle and been like, wait, I already know this. I like, why am I learning this again? I already know this. And I think maybe why you do this podcast and why I do my podcast and why I keep having conversations with people is it's like the lessons that you need to remember to, that are true, that you've learned the hard way is your life's work. And so if you can create 
a business or um, a community or I don't know, there's lots of different containers. But if you can create a way in your life to continue to touch on those points every day, every week, whether you're teaching them, whether you're conversing with other people who are having similar experiences, as you continue to remind yourself of these things, like that to me is where people really start serving others in a huge way. It, it's like you're teaching the things that you need to remember every day. And that's why you teach them because you need to remember them. You need to repeat them. Hmm. Well, I, I, I really do appreciate your time. I do have one last question for you. So, you know, when I, when I think of your work and your journey and everything that you've, that you've been through, naturally I gravitate maybe a bit more like Goggins. I gravitate more to the harder things because, yeah, because the soft stuff comes easy to me, you know, like yeah. all of the fun stuff comes easy, but I'm sure there were the most like miraculous, amazing, extraordinary, fun moments at some point over the last 15 years. Um, yeah. What's, what's something that, um, what's something that you hold on to where you're like, this, this was, this was, this is why we do this. This is a blast. Yes. Oh, I mean, I have so many, but can I tell you my eco one? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, we did a mountain bike that was really muddy. It, it wasn't the muddy one everyone thinks of as the muddy one. There was another muddy one before that muddy one. <laughs> but essentially we were muddy, shocker, and um, pretty tired. And it was heat of the day. And you're, you know, I'm mapping and I know where we're at ish on the map and I know we're going to pop out on this road. And so we're just, we're going and we're going and we're going and we're looking for this road. Um, and so of course the road is always like 10 times farther than you think. Like you're on the map, you're thinking, okay, like we shouldn't be too far from the road. And then you go another hour and you're like, okay, shoot, we still shouldn't be too far from the road. <laughs> Eventually pop out on this road and maybe 15 seconds later, we ride down it and we're in this village. And the Fijians are, by the way, the most friendly people on the planet. I don't think there are more friendly people than the Fijians. They are amazing hosts. And we come into this village and it is a party, like a full on party. The music is going crazy. They are chopping coconuts, like chopping coconuts like crazy with their machetes shoving them in our hands to drink coconut water. They're taking our bikes out of our hands and scrubbing them down, washing them. A woman puts a baby in my arms and literally like shoves her baby into my arms, which I'm happy. Like I spent quite a few, quite a few moments with like kids on my lap, babies in my arms, which is great as a mother to just get that like motherly energy. So I get this baby in my arms and she's like taking selfies and getting my Instagram like name so that she can follow me. There's like, um, you know, everyone's, they're putting like lays over our, our necks and a woman comes by and she's got a bowl full of donuts and they're like homemade donuts. They're round balls, maybe like a bit bigger than a golf ball. She doesn't say anything to me. She literally just takes a donut and puts it in my mouth. She just pops it in my mouth. And it was fried and coated in powdered sugar and like warm. I think it had just come out of whatever fryer she had had it in. That moment, that contrast between being tired, hungry, dirty, wrecked, and then maybe less than five minutes later, like donut in my mouth, baby in my arms, coconut water in my belly, the outpouring of music and love and support and photos. And so, like that to me is one of my like top five experiences of my life. Like just the contrast that happened there reminds me of how quickly things can change. Amazing. Sonia Wick, thank you so much. Thank you oh, for having goodness. me. It's been so much fun. <laughs> so happy to be here. Okay, well, I appreciate it. And what's the best way for people to follow up with you to keep yeah. in touch with what you're doing going forward? I'm totally around the internet as Go Sonia, G O S O N J A, on Instagram or gosonia.com is, is my website. And um, if you loved the race and you want to hear more in depth stories from the racers, their untold stories, you can check out the Tales of Toughness podcast. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll enjoy it if you're into that. Wasn't that an amazing conversation? 
Sonia truly is someone who does hard things. Now, the three key takeaways for me were one, you need to look for opportunities that light you up. Number two, the journey is everything. You will never have a great outcome with a crummy journey. And number three, this one's so good. As you're facing those hard things, remember that work always works. If you want to do hard things, then we need to stop living in fear. We need to stop listening to the voice of doubt in our head because the fear will keep us standing still. Standing still is death. Now, changing gears a little bit, I want to remind you, this is a brand new podcast. I would love it if you would rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It would mean a lot to me. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. If you want to connect directly with me, follow me on IG, drop me a DM, we can connect. And remember, those of us who have something to prove, people like you, people like me, we can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But to do it, you have to think big, you've got to be bold, and you must say yes. Why? Because we do hard things.